Welcome to the Great Books Mini Lectures here at Johnson County. Uh, before we start, as always, I want to thank marketing, uh, video productions, and the CoLab uh, for making this possible. And thank you uh, for coming out over the lunch hour. I'm Michael Carriger. I'm an assistant professor in the English department. And along with Professor uh, Maureen Fitzpatrick, we're uh, organizing this uh, series this year. Uh, this is our second lecture of the spring semester. Um, we'll have one more next semester, uh, excuse me, uh, next month, uh, Misha Kliegman will be speaking on the Master and Margarita, so please come back. Um, to begin, Jessica Tipton is Associate Professor and Librarian here at Johnson County. She completed a Bachelor's of Science in Psychology with a minor in Women's Studies from Kansas State University. She earned a master's in library science from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and she holds an education specialist from the University of Central Missouri. And by the way, she is a former Johnson County Community College College Now student. Mm -hmm. Proud mm -hmm. College hey. Now student. Uh, almost eight years ago, uh, Jessica joined us on faculty. Uh, in fact, I believe her first day was April 5th of 2011, uh, which was her birthday, mm -hmm. is her birthday was in mm -hmm. yep. uh, And previously, Professor Tipton uh, had worked at Rockhurst High School, the Kansas City Public Library, and Washington University in St. Louis. She is involved in many aspects of campus life, and she is former chair of the um, library faculty, and she recently completed a sabbatical. Aside from her duties at the college, uh, Jessica is a Girl Scout troop leader. She is also interested in reading, hiking, identifying plants and animals, crafts, and with her husband, home remodeling. Uh, although she tells me it's actually more like keeping her husband's home modeling habit in check. Uh, she let him buy a two-story slide uh, last fall, and she's promised us that story at some point, so we hope to hear it. For our presentation today, uh, Professor Tipton has chosen Diane Ackerman's 1990 work, A Natural History of the Senses. She was first introduced to the book in high school. Uh, when I asked her why she chose it, she said, it's one that's just always stuck with me throughout my life. And it was the first thing that came to mind uh, when we invited her today. And she says, rereading it this year uh, has reminded me why I love it so much. It's the perfect book for a librarian. Uh, so we'll hopefully find out why that is. Professor Tipton. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. I'm very excited to share um, this book with you, A Natural History of the Senses. Um, I told um, Michael as I was, when I saw the poster, I started panicking a little bit. It's like, oh, I really have to do this. Um, but then as I started preparing more and more for this, it's like, oh, I get to share one of my very favorite books. And that's really exciting to me. Um, how many people have read this book or heard of it? Either one, a few people. So Natural History of the Senses by Diane Ackerman. It was written back in 1990. And we'll talk a little bit about her and you know how I was introduced to the book. Um, I was first introduced to this back in high school. Um, Dr. Dick Dawson um, was a um, teacher at Shawnee Mission South here in town. And he liked to include other sorts of assignments in biology. It wasn't just learning about animals and dissection and everything, he had us write poetry. And so um, he had us read a, a chapter of this as an assignment and just, he would always have us do different things. And he was, he was great, um, just a great introduction to the book and everything. And so it's something that's really stuck with me. Um, this, I'm a librarian and um, this is a quote that I usually have up in my office by Alan Smith, but it says, in order to be really good as a librarian, everything counts towards your work. Every play you go see, every concert you hear, every trip you take, everything you read, everything you know. Um, I don't know of an, another occupation like that. The more you know, the better you're going to be. And that's really how I see the world. Everything I learn about eventually comes up. Um, so I'm always out there trying to experience new things, learn new things. And this book is that, it covers everything. Um, so it's something that really speaks to me and how I love to learn. So Diane Ackerman um, has an MFA and PhD from Cornell University. Um, she's written other books as well. 
Um, Natural History of the Senses is probably her, one of our more well-known titles, and it was written in 1990. The Zookeeper's Wife, 2007, was made into a movie, and so some of you, I see some heads nodding, some of you might know that one. Um, another one that I want to go back and read now, which I haven't read, is 100 Names for Love, um, which was published back in 2011, and it's more of a memoir, so I, I want to go back and read that one after I felt, felt like I had to do this first before I could go and read another book by her. Um, I've decided, as, you know, as I learn more and more about her, I want to be her when I grow up, um, because she has so many amazing experiences. Um, you know, she's swimming with whales, studying bats in Texas, going to Hawaii and, you know, observing seals, um, gardening. She experiences the world and just really savors it. And that's just how present she is in the moment and how she takes the time to do all that is just really amazing. She's won many, many awards, um, and these are just a few of them. Um, she has a pheromone named after her. Um, she's done some research on crocodiles, and so she has a pheromone named after her. Um, but you know, she's, you know, she's a member of the Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's won writing awards, and the list goes on and on. These are just some of them, um, but the list goes on and on. And these are just some things that other people have written about her. Um, Jared Diamond called her a national treasure. And the San Francisco Chronicle, I just, I liked how they kind of wrote about her writing. In the meeting of science and sensu sensuality, the, of nature and art, seen through the prism of personal experience and expression. And that really ex wraps up her writing in a, in a nice way. So natural history of the senses covers everything. Um, there's a whole page on um, names for wind for different cultures and why those names exist and the language. It's a whole, whole page on that. Um, there's folklore, there's literature, there's word origins, um, science, psychology, history, um, philosophy, personal experiences. It's all wrapped up here in one book, and it's just amazing the things that she talks about um, throughout. So we'll go through the chapters and talk a little bit too about reading it the first time versus reading it now. So first time I read this, I was 17. Um, I thought it was great, I loved the book. It's something, as I mentioned, that's just stuck with me forever. Reading it now, it's amazing. I cannot imagine the work that went into this. So she wrote, she published this when she was 42. Um, and it was published in 1990. And as a librarian, I think about the research that went into this when you're covering this many fields. Um, there really weren't really online databases. There aren't ebooks in 1990. Um, interlibrary loan, I'm looking at Jan right now, but interlibrary loan, you would have had to do these paper request forms for all these resources that she's looking at. It's not, you're going to get it automatically. Um, you're, it's gonna take some time to pull all this research together. And I don't know how she did this. I, just, I really wanna look at her research notes and see how this was all pulled together because there is so much information in this book about so many different fields and she's jumping from page to, you know, item to item, she'll have 20 things, 20 authors that mention smell in their books. It's like, how did you take the notes on this? What, what is your memory like that you could have written something like this? And it's just, you know, kind of amazing. Um, her insights into animal behavior and, you know, into history, I think, still remain true. There's been it's been almost 30 years now, so some of the science has changed, and so I'm having to remember that while I'm reading it, where, you know, just, for example, taste. How we define taste and, you know, the areas of the tongue has changed in 30 years. Um, other sorts, you know, other sorts of things have, have, research has progressed, and so I'm having to read those parts of the book a little bit differently than I would have, you know, back then, but the history um, stays a lot the same and everything, but it's a very interesting book to go through and experience. Since it's a book about the natural history of the senses, I'm not going to just talk about the senses, we get to experience things, so we're gonna pass things out. So first chapter is smell. 
You guys get to smell things. We'll pass these out. I have more. And I don't want you to exactly try to guess at what they are. You can. But think more about what memories they bring up. How does it make you feel? Because smell for many people is, it's not just, you don't just smell and not think about it. You smell and experience it. And I, I'll have a key up here if you want to figure out what it is later and everything. My kids helped me make the smell jars. They've been having a lot of fun helping me prepare for this. I have a few things. I've marked lots of pages to share with you as we go through this. I wanted to read the whole book to you, um, but I felt like maybe I shouldn't do that. I should bit, just pick a few pages. But getting into this, I had notes and notes and notes. Um, but we'll just do a few sections. So this is from the chapter on smell. And it says, throughout his adult life, Charles Dickens claimed that a mere whiff of the type of paste used to fasten labels to bottles would bring back with unbearable force all the anguish of his earliest years. When bankruptcy had driven his father to abandon him in a hellish warehouse where they had made such bottles. And so just how smell brings up memories from your childhood, feelings. Um, you know, one of, um, there are lilac bushes that show up on, cam that, that are on campus um, on the way to where I park sometimes. And I will make sure every single day to walk by them a couple times a day just because I love the smell of lilac so much. Um, it reminds me of my childhood. Um, so, different things. So, what's number one? What's number one? Um, <laughs> who has number, do you have number one right now? So I just use vanilla extract for number one. I did go out and buy some different essential oils. Yeah, some of them are easier to tell than others. So, yeah, some of them are hard. Um, so, another section from Smell. Um, she writes that smell was the first of our senses, and it was so successful that in time, the small lump of olfactory tissue atop the nerve cord grew into a brain. Our cerebral hemispheres were originally buds from the olfactory stalks. We think because we smelled. So, just one thing, and I remember reading this part in high school, and this just stuck in my head. <laughs> and when I came across it again, it's like, oh, I remember this part. Um, there's a part about love apples. Anybody know what love apples are? No? <laughs> so, love apples. So, in the Elizabethan age, lovers exchanged love apples. A woman would keep a peeled apple in her armpit until it was saturated with her sweat, and then give it to her sweetheart to inhale. <laughs> now we have whole industries devoted to removing our natural odors and replacing them with artificial ones. Why do we prefer our breath to, to smell of peppermint instead of rotting bacteria, our natural smell? True, a foul smell m might signal disease. We might not be attracted to someone giving off an unhealthy odor and an excess of rotting bacteria could persuade us. We are chatting with, say, a cholera victim, someone who could infect us. But mainly, we value our scent over an, one scent over another, thanks to Madison Avenue's brashness and our gullibility. <laughs> so, I just remember the you know, things that stick with you when you read a book. It's like, love apples. I will never forget love apples. Um, they go on, she goes on to talk about um, doctors using smell to identify illnesses. Um, I know we'll read sometimes um, about cancer sniffing dogs, um, those, sorts, those sorts of things. And she talks about how doctors have always relied on their sense of smell um, to help in diagnosing diseases. So typhus is said to smell of mice, diabetes of sugar, the plague of mellow apples, Measles of freshly plucked feathers, yellow fever of the butcher shop, nephritis of ammonia. So just this, I mean, she goes into all sorts of different things about smell. Uh, Mary and I were talking earlier, earlier because she's read this book, and there's a section in this about um, mothers being able 
to smell um, their infants and infants being able to identify their mothers through smell. And we talked, Mary and I were talking about how um, kind of the superpower, I guess, develops when you're a mom sometimes. I'm, ca I'm calling it a superpower. Um, I can tell when my children are getting sick by how they smell. And it's nothing, it's not anything I realized I would be able to do, but uh, they always think I'm weird now because I go and smell, I'll smell the tops of their heads because I can tell when they're getting, I can, I can tell when they're getting sick and it's just something, I don't know, you can smell your children. So <laughs> it's weird little things like that. But we'll go on to touch. Um, so more things to pass out. So, and this is, maybe I should read the section of the book from this before I pass these out to explain why I'm passing these out. So, she has an experience um, with a colleague. She worked, in, she worked at Washington University um, for a while, which I did not realize until I reread this book. And she started describing things at Washington University and places she had been and what the sunset looks like over Forest Park. And I lived in St. Louis for four years and worked at Washington University while I was out there and had never names she mentions like, oh, I remember that professor or I remember what that walkway looks like. And it was really interesting to revisit it from that point of view too. Um, but with um, Touch, she talks about um, going to a reading with novelist Stanley Elkin, who suffered with, from MS. And Stan, she says, Stanley could still drive and we decided to take his car. But when we got to it and he went around to the driver's door, he stopped and stood for what seemed like ages groping in his pocket. Finally, he pulled out the entire contents of the pocket and set it all out on the car hood so he could see his keys. Many sufferers of MS can feel an object in their pocket for example, a set of car keys, but they can't identify it by touch, which is not something I had ever realized. Um, so, for touch, things to identify, but you don't get to look at them. <laughs> so, pass these out, I'll give you a couple. I'm gonna pass a few this way. So it's identifying things by touch without, without looking at things. Don't, you can look at the back to check after you've guessed. <laughs> so. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting to think about that, how you can't, I don't know, I had never thought about that, how you might not be able to identify something by touch. And how important that gets to be. She goes on to write, feeling doesn't take place in the topmost layer of the skin, but in the second layer. And so she writes, and this is another interesting, this book is just full of weird, interesting facts that I can store in my brain and use for library questions later. <laughs> it's why I love this book. So she says, this is why safe crackers are sometimes showed sandpapering their fingertips. I don't know, if, which I never would have. So they sandpaper their fingerprints fingertips, and I thought, well, okay, so that's to rub off your fingerprints so you don't leave any fingerprints. That's not why it is. It makes the top layer of skin thinner so the touch receptors will be closer to the surface. And just all sorts of interesting things. Are you guys identifying what's in those bags? Maybe. <laughs> And one of them, you might not even know what it is once you look at it. <laughs> My husband made that one. Um, he said there should be a prize if anyone can identify it. So there's one with a metal piece in it. Okay, if you can identify what it is and what it's used for. <laughs> yeah, I have Girl Scout cookies. I can give you a box of Girl Scout cookies. If you can identify 
what it is and what it's used for. <laughs> Other research she goes into, she talks about how touch reassures um, infants that they're safe and that it's okay to grow. And so she refers back to research done with rats and time with their mothers and um, things done in the NICU of, you know, of hospitals and everything um, when babies are born, just, you know, ways that touch reassures everyone that they can grow and it's okay to grow. Um, and when it's safe. going through the senses. Okay, so taste. I have chocolate. I don't know. Which you can try. Um, I have the containers if you want to check ingredients. So it's um, lint, dark chocolate that's infused with chili. And I'll explain why, why I'm doing that. Okay, so passing stuff out again. <laughs> yeah, if you can help pass out stuff, that would be amazing. Thank you. I have spoons, so people can use spoons instead of, yeah. <laughs> you have to pass it out. You can't eat it all. There's, so it's infused with chili. I should let you know <laughs> that it's infused with chili. So, what food do you crave? What? When you ask the question of many people, it's chocolate. Chocolate is something that many people crave, and she has a whole section on chocolate. <laughs> it's, it's good, but it has a kick. The chili comes, and it comes in it a little bit. <laughs> okay. So she has a whole section on chocolate in this. There's, yeah, if you want another piece, you can have another piece. So the Aztecs declared chocolate a gift from their white bearded god of wisdom and knowledge and served it as a drink to members of their court. Only rulers and soldiers could be trusted with the power it conveyed. The Toltecs honored the divine drink by staging rituals in which they sacrificed cho chocolate-covered dogs. Itza, human sacrifice victims, were sometimes given a mug of chocolate to sanctify their journey. So chocolate before you get <laughs> sacrificed, I guess. Um, what her not Hernan Cortez found surrounding Montezuma was a society of chocolate worshipers who liked to perk up their drink with chili peppers, which is why I've got this chocolate, um, pimento, vanilla beans, or spices, and serve it frothing in honey thick and gold cups. Montezuma's court drank 2,000 pitchers of chocolate each day, and he himself enjoyed a chocolate ice made by pouring the drink over snow brought to him by runners from the mountains. So, and then she goes on to talk about how many people crave chocolate, chocolate, see it as an emotional food. You know, it's something that they have to have at the end of the day. Um, she talks about the research in chocolate. I think the research has changed quite a bit in 30 years as to why people crave chocolate. So this is one of the areas of the book that I would, you know, go and look at newer stuff instead of this. Um, but I think there's still a definite craving for chocolate for many people. She also, um, there's this section called the Omnivore's Picnic and talks about food from different cultures and what foods different cultures um, enjoy. And, you know, if aliens came to, our, came to Earth and wanted to know what we, what we wanted to have. And 
what, you know, what foods people enjoyed the most. And so she has, you know, you know, our Japanese friend chooses the appetizer sushi. Um, our French friend suggests a baguette, or better still, croissants. And then she goes into the history of croissants, um, which was interesting. Um, so to celebrate Austria's victory against the invading Ottoman Turks, bakers created pastry in the shape of the crescent on the Turkish flag so that the Viennese could devour their enemies at the table as they had on the battlefield. So I just, she pulls stuff from everywhere and it's just, yeah, it's just interesting that she pulls stuff from everywhere like this. Um, croissants soon just spread to France and during the 1920s traveled with other French ways to the United States. So, sound, I don't have things to hand out, but we will listen to a few things. So, she writes a lot about Helen Keller throughout the book. Helen Keller shows up in the, por in the chapter on vision, of course, she shows up in touch, she just shows up throughout the book. And something that was interesting that she quoted from Helen Keller was, um, Apparently, she, Helen wrote in a letter, um, I am just as deaf as I am blind. The problems of deafness are deeper and more complex, if not more important, than those of blindness. Deafness is a much worse misfortune, for it means the loss of the most vital stimulus, the sound of the voice that brings language, sets thoughts astir, and keeps us in the intellectual company of man. If I could live again, I should do much more than I have for the deaf. I found deafness to be a much greater handicap than blindness. And I had never thought about, I don't know. It's interesting that she thought that. Um, I don't know what others would think about that, but it was interesting that she thought that, that it, was, that it separated her more from the world. So, so this is a, we'll let you do this first. So this is a Carolina Wren, um, it's, and I actually heard, the, not this particular one, but I did hear this this morning, so they're out singing already, um, but there are people that collect, you know, bird calls and everything, and just, you know, the noises maybe you don't pay as much attention to, you don't, they're just there. Um, Diane Ackerman really tries, you know, tries to savor each moment rather than just going on her day to day. She also writes about poetry in here and says that poems have traditionally, um, let me find the right part of this, not that one. Poems have traditionally been written in iambic pentameter, which sounds like this, ba-bum, ba-bum, ba-bum. Ba -bum. Of course, there are many other meters in which to write, and these days most poets don't write in formal meter at all, but there's something innately satisfying about reading a poem written in iams. For one thing, we tend to get around in iams. It is the rhythm of a casual stroll, but it also locks up the heartbeat in a cage of words. And we, who respond so deeply to heart sounds, read the poem with our own pulse as a silent metronome. She writes quite a bit about music in the heart as well um, throughout. And how musician, how composers' heartbeats um, sometimes influence their work. So Gustav Mahler, um, his ninth symphony was his last. And he had found out while he was writing it that he had a cardiac arrhythmia and it shows up in the music. And it's just interesting. She writes so much about music in this chapter and calls music the perfume of sound. Um, she's, um, 
She studied violin. Um, she's a lover of music, but she's honestly, she loves to experience everything. Um, but symphony number nine, um, I pulled up, this is from the, one of the library's databases. So if you ever wanna listen to amazing music um, and have access to all sorts of things, this is a library database called Music Online. But I just did a clip of uh, Mahler's ninth, ninth Symphony, so we could listen to it. So this was his last symphony he wrote before he passed away um, from his heart condition. Um, his symphonies are um, just amazing. They're <laughs> that one's an hour and a half long, so it's just, but it's amazing. Um, it's just the work that goes into composing something, putting all, bringing all the pieces together. Um, and just how much music means to people um, is something that she discusses quite a bit. So vision is her last major chapter in the book. And with vision, she'll talk about color and camouflage and how ex people experience um, color differently, how animals and humans experience color differently. Um, she talks about fibs of vision and optical illusions um, this one gets more confusing the longer you look at it. <laughs> um, Dylan Thomas called them fibs of vision, so that's why she refers to it that way, as fibs of vision. One of my favorite sections of the book is um, from vision, and I'll read this. Um, it says, and this, this is a picture I took um, this past fall when I was in San Diego, um, but it's some, it, I can picture myself there when I read this. And it says, look at your feet. You were standing in the sky. When we think of the sky, we tend to look up, but the sky actually begins at the earth. We walk through it, yell into it, rake leaves, wash the dog, and drive cars in it. We breathe it deep within us. With every breath, we inhale millions of molecules of sky, heat them briefly, and then exhale them back into the world. At this moment, you are breathing some of the same molecules once breathed by Leonardo da Vinci, William Shakespeare, Anne Bradstreet, or Colette. Inhale deeply. Think of the tempest. Air works the bellows of our lungs and it powers our cells. We say light is air, but there is nothing lightweight about our at atmosphere, which weighs 5,000 trillion tons. Only a clench as stubborn as gravity's, gravity's could hold it to the earth. Otherwise, it would simply float away and seep into the cornerless expanse of space. One other part of the vision chapter um, that really stuck out to me, and it's once again, bringing in art and history and science all in one is um, artists and painting. And so she talked about Renoir, and I'll bring up this painting by him. So there's, from the National Gallery of Art, this is Peaches on a Plate. And something she writes about is the color choices in paintings. Um, when Renoir chose his bright reds, oranges, and blues, which there are a lot of in this picture, he was also choosing big doses of aluminum, mercury, and cobalt. In fact, up to 60% of the colors Renoir preferred contained dangerous metals, twice the amount used by such contemporaries of his as Claude Monet or Edgar Degas, who often painted with darker pigments made from safer iron compounds. 
Um, she also talks about how, how Renoir smoked and that he probably didn't wash his hands <laughs> after working with the paints and then rolling his cigarettes. And so he was putting all those chemicals in his mouth. Um, and so there's all this research out there on how all these artists were also rheumatoid arthritis sufferers and the connection <laughs> between the paints they chose and basically how they were poisoning themselves. So just all sorts of things that kind of show up. She'll, yeah, she has a, all sorts of things about artists in here and the things that they experienced and how they saw the world. Um, So throughout the book, Ackerman really encourages us to be present and to notice everything around us and not just walk through life, but really experience it. And this last section, I'll read from it, um, just something that helps me remember to be more present. Um, when you consider something like death, after which, there being no newsflash to the contrary, we may well go out like a candle flame. Then it probably doesn't matter if we try too hard, are awkward sometimes, care for one another too deeply, are excessively curious about nature, are too open to experience, enjoy a nonstop expense of the senses and an effort to know life intimately and lovingly. It probably doesn't matter if, while trying to be modest and eager watchers of life many, life's many spectacles, we sometimes look clumsy or get dirty or ask stupid questions or reveal our ignorance or say the wrong thing or light up, like one, light up with wonder like the children we all are. It probably doesn't matter if a passerby sees us dipping a finger into the moist pouches of dozens of lady slippers to find out what bugs tend to fall into them and thinks us a bit eccentric or a neighbor fetching her mail, sees us standing in the cold with our own letters in one hand and a seismically red autumn leaf in the other, its color hitting our senses like a blow from a stun gun, as we stand with a huge grin, too paralyzed by the intricately vain gaudiness of the leaf to move. So thanks for taking a journey through the book with me today. And um, if you guys want, have questions or want to talk about any of this more, happy to. Um, I hope if you haven't read it or if you haven't read anything by her, you'll try something by her. Um, just the way she looks at the world and brings in her personal experiences and really savors life is something to experience. So thank you. Oh, the metal star thing. So I was wondering if it was something that's used to measure spaces between things. That's yes. the best guess that I have. It is used to measure spaces between things, yes. Okay. Well, I don't know. That's not, <laughs> I mean, it's, that's not a very exact, I didn't give you a very exact definition <laughs> of what You're it closer. is, I'm sure. So. The roller wheels on the, when you're taking off planes. <laughs> Is it over here? <laughs> you can find it. Yeah, so I, I did, I had my family help me with all this because they were having a lot of fun with this. Um, so you can probably tell which ones my kids made. Um, <laughs> I sent them off yesterday and said, go find something, put it in a bag. Um, so yeah, and I sent my husband off and this is what he put <laughs> in a bag. So, so this is for spark plugs. Okay, yep. <laughs> to measure 
spark plugs. I don't know. I don't know why we have these things. Um, but we have all sorts of things in our house, like a two-story slide. <laughs> so actually, it's at a friend's house right now, but it's getting installed at our house. But I don't know. <laughs> Jessica, yeah. I, I think we now understand why you chose the book, especially as a librarian. But mm -hmm. today, where we seem to be pushing more and more for students to specialize uh, in very specific areas, what do you, what do you think the the book has to say for us today. I mean, is, is there a place for this book still today? Oh, definitely. There's still definitely a place for this book. Um, if you're curious about the world, I think cura I have a shirt that I wear sometimes that, say, that says stay curious. Um, just having that curiosity about the world, um, still wanting to always learn something new. Um, everything, I mean, for me, you know, as a librarian, everything I know comes into play at some point. But having these other experiences, these other ideas, help you kind of think outside the box, come up with new ways of looking at things, find new solutions to problems. Um, it's very valuable not to just specialize in one thing and only focus on that all the time. I mean, it's why we have you know, the humanities and um, read great literature and open our minds to new ideas. What did you like so much about it when you were 17? When I was 17, um, I think I was just, I, that teacher was just amazing. Um, I, re I found so ma many of my favorite books through that teacher. Um, it's, I think it was just one of those special experiences that it was something different. It wasn't just, you know, memorize, you know, these parts or this process, it's, it, you know, become part of the world, become part of nature. And I think that's what he was trying to tell us um, when he was doing this. He's just, he's still, in, I think he's still in town, but he's a really interesting person. He would play music in between passing periods. He had his record player in his office and he played music every passing period, he had all these books on display. Um, and he really wanted us to expand our minds and look at things in new ways. So, do you, do you think that's why you're a librarian? Is this why I'm a librarian? Did it lead to it? Did it lead to it? Um, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> that's a good question. I like learning about everything. I had a lot of other things I wanted to be as I was growing up, and you know, like all of us, it takes us a while to find the right path and. And I think part of, yeah, part of why I'm a librarian is because I couldn't pick just one. Um, I want to know everything. <laughs> so, and being a librarian, I get to learn something new every day. So this is, yeah, this really sits with me well. But. You know, we're, we're talking a lot about how people have their faces down in their phones and they're mm -hmm. oblivious to the world. And I think as I'm listening to you, you know, when I go to a restaurant, for me, I, it has to be the whole experience mm -hmm. because I'd rather not eat. If I can't go and the ambiance is good and the, and the food makes me remember it's a memorable moment, mm -hmm. I just would rather not go. Mm -hmm. And so I think about all these people that are down like this and they're all these senses that they're ignoring. And right. so when they're like this and they're eating and they're all that, it's just makes me wonder what's going to happen to the senses, like which ones are going to become weaker, mm -hmm. you know, and blah, oblivious. So we may start thinking about that. Mm -hmm. So we've got to do something to make sure people look up and look at the sky and hear the birds. You know, I'll say that to my son all the time. Did you hear that? And he goes, what? He's 15. Listen, you know, I'm trying mm -hmm. to get him to make his senses stronger. Mm -hmm. And I think so. that's with, um, I have kids, and with um, them, it's, we have to get outside. We just have to go out and experience and, you know, explore and be curious about the world and everything, because you do miss a lot if you're just looking here or, you know, or, you know, just even just, you know, reading a book and that's all you're doing, too. I mean, just making sure to see the world around you and actually experience it and not get so sucked into everything else.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for coming.